I'm excited to be here. I'm really happy that uh, I received the introduction and very proud to be able to talk to you today uh, about this exciting research area. So uh, having said that, I do still crave your feedback. I say this sort of somewhat tentatively since I've never been to space and I don't have any books that have sold 500,000 copies. Uh, but still, I, I really look forward to, to talking with you about this today because uh, of several things that we'll go through throughout the talk. So uh, as we heard before, from the very beginning in the DARPA Grand Challenge, uh, we've seen uh, some amazing things that have happened in the past in terms of self-driving cars. So here we have uh, Stanley, the car from Stanford, which is coming across the finish line in the second Grand Challenge. Um, in the second Grand Challenge, we only had a small subset of teams who participated. Um, and so I think we had uh, teams sort of from all over the U.S., but not that many of them. Uh, and, uh, it, it, and so what motivated DARPA to continue in this work was that cars that will drive us around in the desert only really satisfy a very small number of people. Uh, I don't know how, how often you've run around in the desert in your car, probably not that much. Uh, and so then they held the DARPA Urban Challenge, and here you have uh, Dr. Tony Tether waving the finish flag as uh, another car crosses over. So we saw more involvement from teams throughout the DARPA Urban Challenge because the problem became much more democratized. So in the beginning, in the first Grand Challenge, a lot of the technology and involvement had to do with figuring out sensors and what to do with sensors, and then Almost anybody could put that software together uh, because there was so little data coming in and because so many of the algorithms were so close to control systems. Um, but in the urban challenge, you actually had a lot more of a, of a challenge in terms of logic. So we moved from things where we were just processing sensor data and making decisions to thinking about the mode that the vehicle might be in or whether or not we can trust those data. Um, and so we needed a broader set of people to be involved, which meant that it needed to be easier for people to get in. Um, and as we've seen the trend in the latest uh, few years, so I have a, a slide that I gave from a talk in 2014 about states in the United States that have permits for self-driving cars. Uh, even in the last two years, we've seen a dramatic growth in terms of the states that now support this in some way. And it's getting uh, even more interesting because a bunch of states have also tried to have self-driving cars and it hasn't made it all the way through the legislature or perhaps it's on its way through the legislature. So I, I'm sort of themed with uh, traffic signals here. Green means go, red means we tried it and we had to stop. And orange is like, well, maybe, right? Like you're, you're sort of not sure whether you should stop or should slam on the accelerator pedal. Uh, and some of these states are going in different directions for that same color. Um, and so, as we've seen in the last few years, we have more and more interesting things happen. Uh, I want to pay special attention to this highlight from Google. Our cars will run over fewer pedestrians. <laughs> so we've got that going for us, right? Uh, is, so, so we're going to talk about some of these issues today, like what does it mean to have a safe self-driving car? Uh, we'll just kill fewer people, right? It's not really a great argument to have. Uh, but if you have great lawyers, maybe it's a great enough argument that you could, could go with. Um, and so we've seen a lot of this work has now grown out of companies that have a vested, in, vested interest in figuring out some of the details of self-driving cars for various reasons. So one of the reasons companies are interested in doing self-driving uh, vehicles is that they think that they're going to be able to find out more about you as a driver uh, by sampling the data of the kinds of decisions that you make. And so many of the things that we see in cars today have to do with getting data from the user and then seeing how the user reacts in various situations. Uh, but companies like Google are interested in image processing, video processing, et cetera. Those are all relevant to self-driving cars. Um, but not all people who are working in this area are doing it because they just want to make money. Some of them are actually doing it because they want to save humanity. And so here's a, a great example from Volvo where their ambition is to ensure no, no one killed or seriously injured by 2020. So now we're not talking about just finding out more about drivers. We're talking about actually doing something to, to improve humanity. Uh, and to me as an engineer, this is the number one calling that I have. It's, it's uh, a bit like being in a religious calling, except my calling is to improve humanity through the things that I work on. Um, and so that's my number one goal for anything that I work on. And in self-driving cars, it's especially true that I want to make sure that I don't do something bad 
uh, with the car. So other uh, automakers are also in the business here. So we see Mercedes with their intelligent drive. This is actually a pretty old slide. I think many of the technologies that you find in today's uh, model year for Mercedes are actually using slightly different sensors. But the idea is the same. They want to know the region in which the car is so that they can reason about the kinds of things that they could and couldn't do. And so in uh, other automakers, here's an example from Nissan. Uh, here they were showing some self-driving inside of a parking lot where you might bring your uh, vehicle and you want to go to the cinema or something like this. You just pull up to the front of the parking lot, you get out, and the car goes and parks itself. So it is worth saying, too, that many of the technologies that are required to make this work are pretty expensive in terms of sensors. Or you might need to have a very controlled environment. So the environment for Nissan is that they have a parking garage that has cameras all over it, and they can use those cameras and other uh, sort of real-time embedded systems to figure out where all the cars are. So they know everything about the environment. Um, and this is a trend that we've seen also in self-driving cars, that environmental perception is actually pretty expensive and tricky to do. So anybody here ever heard of Pareto Optimal Solutions before? It's not a necessarily very common term, but I'm glad to see many of you have. Uh, you've probably no doubt, though, heard of the 80-20 rule, that 80% of the results come at 20% of the effort. Uh, and this comes from Pareto optimality, where you have to choose what you call the sweet spot. So how much effort am I willing to put in based on the amount of reward I expect from that effort? Uh, and this guy, Vilfredo Pareto, uh, was not thinking about it in terms of self-driving cars or math. I, th I think his motivation was actually uh, arable land and how much crops you could get from land or something like this. Uh, but the idea is still very similar. So. In the beginning, we wanted to drive across the desert, and we could do that, but we needed a lot of sensors. And then we wanted to drive on city streets, and we could do that, but we still needed a lot of sensors. But where's the sweet spot? Where are we going to actually be helping humanity? So for example, here's a chart of drives in 25 miles per hour or slower. This is fatalities every year. And you see a big jump here in 2009. Anybody want to guess why that might be? Smartphones, yeah, that's a, that's a good guess. Uh, I, I don't want to claim that that's actually what it is because I attended the data science talks yesterday and I know better than to make a claim like that based on one chart. Uh, but it is true that people are driving more distracted now because they want to pay attention to their smartphone. Uh, but for me, like if you think about 25 mile per hour zones or less, many of these zones are school zones. So I want to make sure that uh, we can have technologies that's on board so that we can make better decisions, even at low speeds. So reviewing back now what, si what kind of technologies we need in order to make great decisions for autonomous vehicles, um, we have a slide here from one of the teams in the, the DARPA Grand Challenge from Ohio. So we see some range finders on the side. I think I have a little thingy here. So we have some radar bits here. We have an inertial measurement unit, which is under here. This is a, a rate gyro, usually, that tells you about attitude changes and acceleration. Um, we have some range finders on the side, a uh, laser range finder in the trunk. We have GPS on the top, a secondary GPS, because the GPS error that you can expect at any time might be around one meter. Um, and so you want to have two of them more than one half wavelength apart so that you can do better than that. Um, and then we also have some visual information here. So this is a fairly old kind of setup for autonomy, but you can see there's a lot of sensors on there. And Google actually is making great strides here, but they still have a huge cost for their vehicle, about uh, 250K just for the equipment. Anybody interested in buying a car at 250K right now? If so, I'd like for you to also donate to my university because I think you have money that you're just willing to set on fire, right? So bring now to the bear. So, so we've seen you know, the examples from Google, and many of you know that Tesla also is uh, interested in the autonomy market. Uh, the Model 3, which is their newest vehicle, is it selling for about $250,000? No. So there's a pretty big discrepancy here, right? Why is it that Tesla can do something for 35 k and that includes the vehicle cost? but many of the other systems that are out there and running around right now have such a high cost for sensors. And so it all boils down to how we perceive our environment. Um, this is an example that I got straight from Tesla's website that talks about how they want to figure out what's around them so that they can reason about a path that they can take where other vehicles might be on that path. Um, obviously, they're going to need to do this at something of a high rate, 
uh, because you'd like to be able to make sure that while you're driving in traffic, if someone makes a, a decision that you disagree with, that you'd like to slow down fast enough to avoid knocking into them. And so you have to have systems that are pretty accurate and run at a fairly fast rate in order to make things work. So something of a, a bit of an overview now of the entire uh, domain of, as we've seen it in the, the past few years, we can see that on the left we have like lots of technology that's sort of bolted to the outside. And as we continue to move to the right, we see more and more of those sensors finding their way into the body of the vehicle. So the vehicle looks less like a, a robot that you see in, uh, in, some kind of, in some person's lab, and much more like a car that you just actually drive. So on the left, if we think about things that were happening, say, 10, 12 years ago, uh, the characteristics were that the software was fairly monolithic and that we were using sensor fusion, which is a whole bunch of sensors that are out there to build a map of the world, and then we reason in that map about what we should do and where we should go. And as we've moved from left to right now, we see that now we're starting to, in the mid, uh, late 90s, we're starting to now thinking about composable software instead of monolithic software. So by the way, I know that uh, in the DARPA Grand Challenge 2, DGC2, uh, there was a guy named Mike Montemarlo that worked at Stanford. Um, I know this from news reports. I don't know this because I know him. Uh, but he was the guy that everything had to go through. And so if you wanted code to run on the car, you basically just emailed it to Mike, and he integrated it into one giant executable. Does this sound great to you guys or what? <laughs> right. I hope he doesn't lose his laptop, right? Like that might be the only running version that he has. So, so and I'm, I'm sort of teasing a little bit because we would never dream of doing something like that now. But in the early 2000s, we still had one executable on our desktop that we ran that generated something for us or that gave us some kind of service. Uh, and life has changed since then. We're now moving to software that's composed from lots of different services that are being provided, maybe not even running all on the same machine. They might be running on many different machines and at different time rates. Um, but we still had sensor fusion, which was a bunch of sensors that fused together into one concept of the map that, uh, that exists of our environment. And then we reason about that map in some way. And so finally now we're seeing advancements that are taking us from that $250,000 price mark for sensors to something much more reasonable through composable perception. So now we've had composable software enter through various service-oriented architectures. Composable perception means that we're interested in finding out something from sensors that talk to one another at a much lower price point. So in terms of the, the scale of how all of these things are happening, we can actually look uh, back a little bit at some of the uh, precedents that were set for avionics. So there's uh, many parallels from autopilot software for Boeing and Airbus to self-driving cars. And if you look at the trend in software for avionics, this is actually the kind of trend that you want to see for your company in terms of sales, right? This is not the trend that you want to see in terms of lines of code that you have to maintain for a system. Uh, and in fact, the cost is also exponential. So not just the lines of code that it takes to produce, but the cost that it takes to maintain that, to serve that in order to debug that. Um, and I think the, the most recent figure that I heard in terms of certification for software for a new airliner is about 50% of the cost of the airliner is the airframe development, and 50% of the cost is software. That's a huge percentage required when you're talking about uh, billions of euros or billions of dollars in order to develop um, a new commercial airframe. So how did we as service people for software get past this exponential increase in single executables, we went to composition instead. So we want to think about some system that, uh, that we have has a bunch of different processes that talk to one another. Now here I don't mean a thread process. Uh, I mean a process in terms of some functional behavior that has inputs and outputs. And so if you can think of a process that has inputs and outputs, you can now name those inputs and outputs and even strongly type them. Uh, and then you can begin to compose through uh, a concept that we call module interconnection, the various types, uh, and then you now have something of a type-safe system. So you understand that the output of this process feeds as an input to another process. Um, and with graphs like these, you can actually statically schedule your system to make sure that it runs correctly in real time. You can even reason about containing a bunch of processes into one parent process, uh, and then abstract that in some way that you now have another component that you can think of as a composition of a bunch of other components. So this is how we've managed complexity in software for a long time, that we have processes call other processes or functions call other functions. Um, and then 
we want to be able to do stress testing of the individual components as well as the composed system. So functional behaviors in this way are actually pretty easy to test. You have a bunch of canned inputs, and you compare them to the expected outputs of those canned inputs. So you can begin by having, say, a reference implementation in one uh, kind of language, and then move to another language and compare the inputs from one to the outputs of the other to make sure that you've implemented your code correctly. So while we have functional behaviors fairly easy to test, the non-functional behaviors don't compose very well at all. So these are issues like timing or how much memory we use. Uh, these kinds of things actually turn out to be pretty important when it comes to making sure that you make a decision in time or that you have a card that you're going to be proud of. So do you guys remember this when the Waz spoke up about his uh, Prius? So I, I don't actually remember what the outcome of this was. <laughs> Uh, I don't know that he actually was able to take it to, to Toyota and demonstrate his use cases, but he thought about his car like a software process. He had a well-defined set of sequence of interactions, and from those sequence of interactions, he could generate, he claims in the article, an output which doesn't actually match with what should happen. So he had essentially a sequence model that gave him an exception condition for his car. This is how we think about our software systems, but it's non-trivial to do that for hardware systems where you have lots of different things interacting at different time scales. So I actually always wondered why, um, if you were in a car and the accelerator went out of control, why you didn't just shift your car into neutral, right? <laughs> Maybe that's because I used to drive a stick shift, right? I don't have one anymore, but in a stick shift, you, know, you can pretty easily change what your car is doing at any time. Uh, with an automatic shift, it actually works too. Um, but this is not always a good way to escape something bad that might be happening. Um, and so this is an example uh, of a video from a guy who's driving along in his Tesla, and his Tesla actually steers into oncoming traffic. I do not recommend doing this, by the way. Um, so, so in terms of now the interaction that you have with your vehicle, how comfortable are you in going out to buy an autonomous car right now? Anybody? Anybody? Um, and so, so as I pointed out before, if your accelerator is out of control, you have a lot of time to react. You can just shift your, uh, your shifter into neutral, and then your engine will explode, but your car won't crash. Um, and so I'd rather have my engine explode than to do a, a head-on collision with someone any day. But the time that you have to react in this situation is not long. And so you, thankfully, you know, the driver has his hands pretty close to the wheel, so he senses himself going over, um, and then he shifts to the right. But we also have examples, this is uh, from the same story in the Daily Mail, uh, about somebody who's driving along, I think this is just outside of Seattle, um, and his hands aren't on the wheel and he senses his car sort of like shifting over to the right, and so he just grabs the wheel and starts to turn to the left. So you have to be really vigilant if you're using a system like this, um, but the cost of failure is actually pretty big. Like the, this, this would not be good if it were to end up like this. So this is where we start to think about like how would I test a system like this, or Alternatively, how would I design a system like this so that it can be uh, used in a fairly good way? So I really did appreciate yesterday the, the talks in the data session um, because many of the folks there who were talking about algorithms for machine learning or techniques for machine learning had an architecture which is sort of uh, described in this way. So uh, I want to point out that things over here on the left, these are related to uh, training data that we have and outputs that we expect from those training data. So the canonical example that's used for this is pictures of cats, right? Uh, because cat videos are really what makes the internet run. It's not really used for anything else. And so we have a bunch of pictures that have cats in them. We feed them into our learning algorithm. And some of those pictures are cats and some are not. And then from that learning algorithm, we generate a runtime algorithm, which might be a bunch of matrices and weights from matrices, et cetera. Um, but then at runtime, we take in those data feed them to our runtime algorithm, and we expect similar kinds of labels to come out. So how does this fit for autonomous vehicle design? This is actually where some of the composable perception ideas start to feed in. So many of the ways that we can think about reducing the cost of the sensors of autonomous cars have to do with using much cheaper sensors that give us the same or similar kinds of behaviors. So here we can see that we have uh, an autonomous controller, which is getting information from the environment somehow. Um, and it's feeding its output into a learning algorithm and comparing that output to user input. So this is actually a really unique way to think about how do you design an autonomous controller with a human in the loop. 
So you put your autonomous controller on board the vehicle, and it listens all day long to how you drive. So in various situations, whether you slow down or speed up, how, how close you find yourself following another vehicle, as well as what other vehicles even are with the onboard data and sensor, uh, data acquisition and sensor technologies that we have. And so then you feed all of that into your learning algorithm to generate new versions of the autonomous controller. Again, in this case, we're not using the autonomous controller for anything. We're just learning information about uh, how the system could behave based on how you drive. And then when you want to actually have the autonomous controller work, you then compare user input when the user feels really uncomfortable about what's happening, right? So you saw the driver like grab onto the steering wheel and steer out of the way. Um, so here now we're actually saying, hold on, I just found an exception condition. Uh, I want to take that exception condition and generate now some new uh, user inputs and, or sorry, some new algorithm work so that I can see why is it that I responded in the wrong way. So our system has to be robust at runtime in order for us to do this. If the system's not robust at runtime, uh, then you might be embarrassed about what's going to happen. Hmm. The joke's on you. <laughs> Actually, I stole that joke from a guy named John Doyle uh, at Caltech a few years ago. Totally true, right? We've come to expect that the systems that we use for presentations are actually not that robust. Uh, so some of you were groaning like, oh God, what a terrible joke, right? But what's the good of a counterexample in your test case if the person can't walk away from the crash, right? We don't want to just say, oh, if we find exception conditions, we'll just fix them later. Uh, and then you see carnage on the roadway. So this is not an acceptable way to test systems in this way. So we need new kinds of architectures like this one. So this is an architecture that probably nobody is using, but this is a kind of architecture that might work. Um, and I have to say, you know, in, in terms of full disclosure, I don't have any non-disclosure agreements with any companies. All I know is what I get from news reports, et cetera. But I've also thought a lot about how I might do this in terms of my own research. So now if you want to, for example, replace uh, a $30,000 sensor on the top of your car with a camera, then you can take the proven autonomous controller with the really great sensor information and compare your new replacement autonomous controller with a much cheaper situation and then analyze to see how it is that you behave. So you can compare the outputs of one controller with another and generate new exception criteria while you still have the existing architecture doing safe things for you. So this will even also work if you have a user instead of an autonomous controller making those kinds of choices. So now you can find out about those exception criteria without actually having an exception. And you can check what we call the functional and non-functional viability of some new process uh, in a nice way. But you still have to worry about other kinds of things for self-driving cars. Uh, this is actually just from a, a few weeks ago uh, where he had somebody in his Tesla who rear-ended another vehicle at high speed. Um, and if you dig a little bit into this, uh, the, the driver's like, oh, I totally thought the car was gonna stop. Uh, I was sitting there, sitting there, waiting and waiting and waiting, and then when it got too late, I slammed on the brakes. Uh, so Tesla went back and they looked at the data from the person's car and said, ah, actually, <laughs> you hit the brakes a long time before this and you disabled the autopilot. So this is the standard way that cruise control works. If you just tap your brakes, the cruise control goes off. Um, and so he was a little nervous before and maybe didn't realize that he'd tapped the brakes. He still thought the vehicle was going to take over and then it never did until it was too late. Um, and so this is what's typically called in avionics as mode confusion. So the pilot and an aircraft, if they have mode confusion, can end up pulling up on the stick instead of pushing down, uh, which is what happened in the Air France crash from a few years ago. So you really need to understand the state of the vehicle and the state of the software in the vehicle if you want to make safe decisions. So, so now we need to be able to think about where all of these problems are taking us and how can software help. So we have lots of different kinds of problems. We have unclassified runtime data from lots of different kinds of sensors. We have models that are opaque. They don't actually appear in equation form anywhere. They're just components that run. Um, we have sensors that are maybe going to go out while we're driving, so we want to be able to respond to that. Um, we have issues of liability where we need to be able to take care of things. We have the cost of sensors going down, and then we also have the need to certify our software in some way because drivers are not going to be happy to buy a car if they think at any moment that the car might crash and it's probably still going to be their fault. So there are lots of big questions here that we need to be able to address. So in terms of, uh, this is our vehicle here uh, at a 
not a fundraiser event that we had a couple of years ago at the University of Arizona. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven people here for our autonomous car. It's, this is a joke sort of left over from the DARPA Grand Challenge days when we said, yeah, we only had a team of 20 people for the, the car with no driver, right? Um, but we need to do better than this. We need to have issues that scale better in terms of workers and how many people you need to have working on the project, as well as the amount of confidence that you have in your system. So this general area, the area that I work in called cyber physical systems, isn't easy because of this reason. So we're interested in things where we have intersection of control systems, communication systems, and computation systems. So many of you have had classes that interact in two of these areas, uh, but the classes that interact in all three of these areas are few and far between because the prerequisite is to be an expert in all of those other areas. And it's not easy to find someone who, who has those kinds of qualifications, especially not, for example, uh, at the undergraduate level. And so, so the reason why it's hard is that you have, essentially, if you're doing something like real-time control, then you're assuming that there's no problem in communication. So you sort of hold fixed this one bit and say, well, we're always going to have reliable communication, and then you solve a bunch of other problems. So when communication becomes unreliable, now suddenly it's really hard to do some of those things with the assumptions that you'd made. So we have lots of examples where we've worked on this so in the past, data from the house in Arizona, and I thought that I'd turned that off before. Um, I, 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 it's not that I don't want you to hear the sound, it's just that I have four videos with sound, and so hearing all four of those sounds at once doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so this is a competition of a bunch of undergraduates working uh, that involved them using a simulator to do a lot of their design, uh, but they're, they're actually picking up mosquito traps. Uh, this is sponsored by Microsoft. The, uh, the project has to do with being able to detect the flow of bloodborne illnesses. Uh, but it was a bunch of undergraduate students that were able to leverage a simulator and then design a really complex cyber-physical component to pick up this trap so that they could automatically pick it up and deploy it without depleting their batteries or, or without having to send somebody out into the jungle to do something um, that, that would put that person in danger of being bitten by a mosquito. So then we also have examples from avionics over here where we're using boundary level certification to make sure that, uh, that the vehicle is moving along in a way where it's going to avoid collision at all times. Um, we have something here where we're actually sending floating sensors downstream uh, using the same kind of algorithms that you use to detect traffic in a traffic flow. We want to detect things in water as water flows. Um, and then over here on the left, we have an example where we're actually uh, correlating the cost that it takes to cool or heat your home with the amount of uh, temperature change that you think that you need. So it'll actually help you figure out the set points that you should use based on how much money you're willing to spend. So all of these things are things where you have to think about the communication aspects, the computation aspects, and the control aspects. And the systems have to be able to interact on multiple levels of timing and closing the loop. Um, and so this is, this is a slide that I really like because you see lots of big things. Uh, so like over on the left, you see issues of you know, being able to change my lifestyle. How would I want to do that? Uh, what, what kind of choices should I be making that I won't see the results from in, say, more than 30 days? So, you know, deciding how to eat better or how to do exercise can be hard to stick with unless you know that it's going to eventually pay off. And then over here on the right, you see things where this is actually so fast that uh, for many of us, it's instantaneous. So we see things on the left where the time constant is so big that you need to have public comment or regulation in order to make sure that as a society we make good choices for things on the left. For things on the right, these are actually only possible through automation. We can't imagine always having a human in the loop there. And for the things here in the middle, well, these are things that we've typically been doing on our own uh, or that we think we've been doing on our own. Um, and so autonomy is moving from this region here where the timescales are really fast further to the left. And we need to feel like we're in control of those kinds of things. But more importantly, we need to be able to specify those kinds of things in software in a nice way. So the two paradigms that are commonly used in order to do this are um, discrete mode control, or discrete systems descriptions that you might see in state models, state flow, state charts, however you want to think of it. Um, so these are typically reactive systems where you receive an event, or you register for an event and receive it, and then you react. And then we have on the bottom what we call functional models or time-triggered models, where we're operating always on the most recent input that we received, no matter when we received that input. 
And so these time-triggered models are really good for describing things like control systems, uh, for describing things like uh, state changes we need models like at the top. And so the issue is that these models don't always compose in a nice way. We need a bunch of theory to, to help us figure this out. So going back to this example of how much time do you have to react to your self-driving car when it starts to behave in a bad way, um, you'd really like to know the controllers that I have will be able to make that reaction time correctly. So I want to give you a little teaser of some of the research that we do in this area uh, by showing you some examples of how you can think about this in, in a new way. So if you think about as your autonomous car is moving, you're collecting data and you're making a control decision. Then you collect more data at a new time and you make another control decision. Um, and you hope that your control decision completes before you actually get your next state update. Because if it doesn't, then you've missed a deadline. And missing a deadline in a hard real-time system can mean system failure. You, you really don't want to do this. Um, and the reason why is that you might be wanting to avoid some kind of an obstacle. And if that obstacle is moving, then you want to be able to react to the motion of that obstacle in real time. So as you're moving around this obstacle, you might actually have a small margin for error in order to get around it. And this is true for those of you who are drivers. If you wanted to avoid a bicyclist, for example, that's on the path and there's an oncoming vehicle, uh, you need to be pretty sure of how your system's going to react as you swerve around. Um, and so things like this are actually not easy to do because the models that we use to predict behavior don't always match the physical system. So if you pick a pretty accurate model in order to make sure that you avoid this obstacle, it'll take so long for you to make a decision that you'll actually collide with the obstacle here. So you can't always use the most accurate model that you have. So you can say, oh, easy. Uh, I'll just use uh, a simpler model so that I can always get a really fast reaction. And if you do that, what may happen is that the vehicle will actually collide with the obstacle because your model is wrong. And so there, there's no solution, right? <laughs> well, we need theory in order to help us understand what it is that we need to do. So we have these competing constraints. One of them is that we need to be able to avoid obstacles. We need to have really fast decision making, but we also need to have really accurate models when we need them to be accurate. Um, and so the research in this has to do with exploring what's my design space and how can I integrate what I know about software and software response times in order to perform this computation in time with a model that's accurate enough. And so again, uh, in order to do this, we use some of the classic uh, tools that are out there for control systems. Uh, the most common tool that's out there for control systems is Greek letters. Um, and so for those of you who are afraid that you wouldn't see any equations in this talk, uh, I'm happy to say I have some, uh, but I'm not going to go over them. I just wanted to tell you that we use math and it's magical, right? So this magical math tells us how our system should behave, but it's not easy to code it up. So we need to take advantage of other kinds of tools in order to make sure that this works. Uh, at a high level, what we're doing is deciding at runtime with some supervisor, which controller do I need to use in order to make a decision fast enough? And that's going to depend on how much I'm going to be steering my steering wheel in large part and how fast I'm going to be going. So as a teaser, uh, you can see a difference here between two models that we're using. This one is obviously has more Greek letters in it, so it's much uh, more complicated. Uh, but more interestingly, it has six modes of uh, six state variables here, and here we have three state variables. We have the products of a bunch of sines and cosines here, and so this is actually what makes this harder as a model is not that there's just more states. It's that if we want to optimize our system, then the gradient descent algorithms that we'll want to use at runtime might take much longer to converge. And the reason that we have to have a lot of these other variables has to do with the stiffness of our tires and the various masses that we have of each tire, um, because these react differently at different tire angles and at different speeds. Um, and so if we want to know our behavior at those speeds, we need to have a really good model of the system. So the, the overall approach that we have here is that we want to take the difference in our current state and compare that to the difference in the predicted next state and choose the smallest value that we have there um, and so this describes essentially which mode we need to pick. So in order to figure this out, we actually have to know how wrong our model is, and we also need to know how long it takes for our system to make a decision with that model. So now you can see these non-functional parameters coming in, like the timing of your system, and how the timing of your system is going to impact a decision that you want to make. Um, so actually, for most of us in this room, timing is just something that we always want to shrink, right? As long as it's getting faster, we'll always be happy. 
But in real-time control, sometimes you're actually not always just wanting it to be faster. You just want it to be reliable. You want to know that the decision will always be done by a certain time so that you can provide an upper bound uh, for how your system should behave. So we can compare these somewhat graphically, which uh, eases the strain of those of you trying to read the equations. Um, and we can see that one mode has a lot more error than the other mode here. So when we have a high steering angle and high speed, there's a lot of error in these models. Uh, but at low steering angle and low speed, the models are actually pretty close to one another. Um, and so that will enable us to choose that other model. And we can even normalize this by the execution time. So I want to just point out here that we have an execution time that's averaging uh, or pretty close to about 50 hertz here. So we have 0.02 seconds return for our simple model and 0.05 seconds return average for the more complicated model. So it's more than twice as slow to use the more accurate model. Um, and now we can take this into account and normalize how our system should behave. So, if we, so we normalize this in this thing called uncontrollable divergence, which tells us, depending on which model we're going to use, how far we will travel before we get a new return time and how bad our estimate will be at that return time. So if we use our much accurate model, such accurate, wow. So we have our much accurate model here, and we can see that we still have some divergence, but really big gaps in between the cars. And with our really terrible model, we get really fast updates. And over time, the gaps in our cars are actually smaller, unless we're at high steering angle. So if we have a high steering angle with our vehicle, then these gaps get really big, uh, and it's really not great. But fortunately, the great news is that nobody actually drives their car at high speed with a high steering angle. This is actually a really fun video if you want to watch it. Um, this is a, a woman who gets into a car with a date and pretends like she can't drive a stick. Uh, and so like, she's totally trolling the person in the passenger seat. Um, and then they, she pretends like she makes a wrong turn in this parking lot and then lets it go, right? Uh, and, and the reactions of the passengers are actually pretty great uh, in this example. But you actually have to be a pretty good driver in order to do that, or something like this will happen. Uh, this is a picture of the, one of the Carnegie Mellon teams in the DARPA Grand Challenge where they flip their car over because the car Thankfully, right, just like we told it to, it drove at this velocity with this steering angle along this road. Uh, and the car sort of mindlessly flipped itself over and broke this really expensive sensor on the top. Um, so we don't want to do that. But like I said, thankfully, most of us don't actually drive like that. Um, this is some driving data from me as I was driving around Tucson in, uh, in the vehicle where I was plotting over time how fast I was going versus what my steering angle was. Um, and you can see actually a really nice uh, approximation that we can do with this exponential curve here, where we can show that I'm almost never, for example, going more than eight meters per second with a tire angle percentage of more than 20%. So we can take this into account and design a controller so that if somebody tells my vehicle to go this fast with this steering angle, then our controller will actually pick a point on this line instead of just blindly following along there. Um, and when you do this, you can actually get uh, different kinds of controllers depending on how aggressive you want to drive. So if you want to drive like my grandmother, you get a different behavior than if you want to drive like my little brother, uh, who's much more aggressive. And so we call this the, the comfort curve, or the, the name in the lab is actually the line of death, because on this side you're safe, and on this side you're not. Uh, and so. Again, one of the reasons that we want to do this is we're using a test bed that could kill us at any time if we give it the wrong information, right? I, I, I don't want to sort of joke about that too much because it's really dangerous to drive a self-driving car. Uh, like if you're compiling something and you run a test, you're like, oh, that was just a sign mistake. I'll fix that, right? Good luck with the sign mistake with oncoming traffic. I do not recommend it. So we can now uh, normalize these plots by the return time and come up with a really great uh, decision tree that tells us when we should pick what. Um, and so in this example, we can actually compare the line of death, which we've plotted here. So this is the rest in peace area, and this is the safe area. Um, and so one nice result that we have is that we can show that if you're on this side of the curve, you should choose the dynamical model. And if you're on this side of the curve, you should choose the kinematic model. And uh, the dynamical model would be used when you're on this curve. So it means that you're, you're not going to be making such an approximation that you might end up uh, flipping your car over because you don't understand the vehicle mode. So it actually works pretty well, even if you have a lot of obstacles that you want to get through. Um, and in fact, so we can see the different mode changes happening here. 
Uh, the vehicle is a much darker color, like a blue color, when we're going straight, and whenever we need to turn, it turns to magenta because we're, we're actually using the other mode. Um, and so this gives us great information about what our errors uh, are and how we can expect those errors. Um, and so we can see that we actually end up doing fairly well with our hybrid controller. This is another great example of the kinds of things you should expect to see um, in talks by controls people. You should see Greek letters. You should see plots uh, where things decay to zero. Um, and then you should also, in any great talk, you should see great three-dimensional plots. So we can see that it actually also works for airplanes. So we can reduce the return time average pretty significantly, um, which means that we can react faster at runtime. Um, and like I said, you'd love to see any plot where you begin at a big number and then the numbers get really small over time. Uh, this is how you know you're talking to a real professor, right? Um, and so what we can see is that the theory actually works pretty well, but we want to be able to take it and show how we can make this work in the real world. Um, and in order to scale self-driving cars to the population in general and actually improve society in the way that we'd like, we need to have cheaper sensors out there um, and cheaper sensors may not be the only solution that we need, so we may actually have to pick our battles for what we want to do. So I, do any of you actually like to drive? Yeah, me too. I actually have a, a 1976 Mercedes-Benz 240D. Uh, anybody ever seen a car like that pass them on the road? No, no, it's, it's a slow car. 2.4 liters, 0 to 60 in 7.2 minutes. Um, that car is amazing, right? But I love to drive it. Uh, unless I'm going to drive a long way, right? So this is us heading back to Tucson from Texas, and it's like, oh, your next turn is in 420 miles. Nobody wants to do this, right? Uh, and then there are other tasks that either we don't like to do or we're actually really bad at doing. Uh, this is a car that parks close to me every day, and I hope they pay for two parking spaces. Um, and then there are other things that we'd much rather be doing in the car, like my son Jack would much rather sleep in the car than drive the car at any time. Uh, so, so we can think about things that we could be doing if we didn't actually have to pay attention. Um, and so the kinds of things that we want to do in our car might or might not be easier to do if, with certain kinds of sensors. So when we think about things in terms of software, we think about the use cases that we have and how we respond to those use cases. Um, and so some of these use cases are actually easier to implement than others. Uh, and we'd like to pick the ones that are either going to be safest or, uh, or will at least be the cheapest to do. So in order to do that, we've been working on a test bed at the University of Arizona so that we can experiment with various controllers that we have. Um, it's a Ford Escape uh, hybrid car, for, I think from 2008 or 2009. Uh, this is me putting all the computers in the back of it. I don't actually move this fast unless I've had a lot of espresso. And we actually have a bunch of safety things in here. So we have a, the ability to put it in pause mode. Uh, we can push an emergency stop at any time, which locks the brakes. Uh, it doesn't actually lock the brakes. It just issues a, a brake command, and the ABS is still triggered if you need it. Uh, we have what's called a dead man switch, which means if we don't get any information in a certain time, that the vehicle stops. So this is the kind of safety feature that you need in case your controller optimization algorithm doesn't come back. And now you don't want to just continue issuing the last command as long as you go if you lost communication with some uh, piece of your equipment. So we have a couple of hardware additions on it for safety. We have this cool spinning Velodyne sensor that gives us data that look like this. Um, this is us just driving around in a parking lot. Uh, you can see here we have a, a light pole that we can see. Uh, this is a passenger van over here. Um, and actually, the resolution of this sensor is incredible, which also means that the data files that you save from this sensor are really big. Um, uh, just a couple minutes can be like five or six gigabytes of information. Um, and so we also have on board an inertial system which we use in order to see where we've driven and where our data is reliable and where it's not. But even with just an inertial sensor, you can do some cool things. Here we're now in simulation. Um, you can do some cool things like check to make sure that you actually follow a path correctly. Uh, and so this is from the simulator that we use. Uh, you can see that we're actually trying to follow some path and we may or may not be following it correctly. Um, I think here I actually try to add the, the trajectory so you can see what it is, but I'm going to skip that for now. So with those interfaces to the vehicle, we can abstract how it is that we want to control it through models. Um, and I typically use something called domain-specific modeling for this, which is a very common approach for lots of complex systems in order to scale how you interact with the system. Um, so if you've ever used uh, SolidWorks or LabVIEW, Simulink, et cetera, this is a very common approach here. Um, and so if you have a fairly simple idea for how you'd like to interact with your system, 
you can design a modeling language using concepts from UML where you can specify the types, their allowed associations and labels, um, and then you can generate at the end result a diagram so that you can draw this kind of system. Uh, and with that diagram, you can then compose various bits of software really fast. And with this kind of composition, we can now take on an agile approach, which I tend to use the, the spiral development process, which is a kind of agile process. And, unless you don't think it is, and then we can talk later about whether I should still say this is agile. Um, and so our approach is that we do some simulation in MATLAB. We replace noisy data with da or data from MATLAB that's clear with noisy data, maybe some noisy data from the actual car. We check to make sure that we can do the same thing in simulation. Then we move it to Simulink, generate the code, run the generated code finally on the actual vehicle. So this allows us to go from 0 to 60, if you will, in a very short amount of time. And every summer, we actually have students who come and do things with the vehicle in a span of less than 10 weeks. And so you can see like, the, the impact that we have here is that each one of these students showed up knowing absolutely nothing about the car. And 10 weeks later, they were able to make the car drive and do amazing things, largely because of the scale of the tools. And so you can actually, if you go to our YouTube uh, site, you can see lots of videos that they have, as well as videos of our simulator doing stuff. Um, I want to highlight just a couple of them. Here's a team last year that used uh, an Android cell phone to do in-car following uh, and stop and go traffic. Uh, I had to, uh, I earlier made sure that the sound was off on this video because they were so happy that it was working. They said a lot of words that no one should hear. Um, which I didn't notice until one day I plugged in the sound in a presentation. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> Had no idea he could even say that, right? Um, but you know, the, the amazing thing about it is, again, you know, he's just holding his cell phone here. How great would it be to rock up to your car, plug your cell phone in a holder, and then not have to worry about traffic until you got to work? That's coming. That will happen. Here's another example from uh, two other students, Isenia Velasco and Charles Johnny. Uh, they actually did an implementation of that switched model predictive control, again, in less than 10 weeks through this, the scale that's allowed by the, the composition of our modeling tools. Um, you've maybe seen people using a laptop while they are driving before. It wasn't very safe. I actually wasn't really happy that Charlie was doing it here, but he still sent me the video, right? Um, and so some of these amazing things you know, get us a lot of publicity and press. But for me, part of the, the interesting impact has to do with you know, the smile that you see on the faces of, of the students as they're doing it, um, and the fear that you see of the other people in the car with them. This is actually Kenan's mother. Uh, you can imagine like teaching your child to drive and then later riding in a car that your child taught to drive. Um, but if we can do this kind of system implementation with pictures, how young do you have to be before we're going to trust you to draw something that you want to have the vehicle do? Um, and so we're actually looking and seeing how small we can shriek this. Uh, recently, we did some work with a, a middle school that we have in the local area where we found a bunch of robotics students that were doing tabletop robotics. Um, and so they already knew how to control a vehicle like this one to move between dots based on planning. And so we developed a domain-specific language here. This is my student, Matt Bunting, who did a lot of this work. Uh, talking with the instructors there. And so the students actually show up. They get a nice domain-specific language in order to plan their trajectories. They synthesized that to run on the tabletop robots, and then they synthesized it again and ran it with the actual vehicle. Um, and so here you can see, sorry, I skipped a little bit there so we could see a little bit faster here. So we went from the idea to the platform, um, and then the students actually get to see you know, the vehicle doing cool stuff. They get to see all this nice uh, sensor data to sort of get an idea and a picture about what's out there, what a career in technology might mean for them. Um, and it's especially meaningful, I think, for students because we get reactions like this one. Um, this kid was actually really happy, right? <laughs> Um, but but this, this, this is the body, the group of students that was affected by this. And maybe one, maybe two, maybe ten of these students later decide to make a career out of technology that never would have before because of some impact that I had. And I want you all to think about those kinds of things that you can do as well for how you can have a great impact on someone, um, especially populations that might currently be underserved in engineering. So in order to, to make it more available, even further available, we also have the ability for you to download a copy of our test bed to simulate and test it. Um, you can find this link from my Twitter feed as well. Uh, we actually expose everything on our vehicle through ROS, and so you can download a ROS simulator uh, that allows you to do cool things like build a Simulink model and then push a button and generate the code and then watch the vehicle follow your Simulink model. 
So we have lots of these examples on our, our YouTube page where you can see us working through the tutorials, and everything is open right now. So we just made a, a pre-release of our very first release a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so with these kinds of things, you can see uh, you know, just in a couple hours after you finally download it, you can watch the vehicle do turns, which is actually not very exciting at all. Um, it'll just do this all day, but this is our open loop like test, you know, one of the very first unit tests we sort of had for the Compose system. Um, and then you can later do things like this, so you can check to see how well our safety system is working. Um, so we actually are commanding the vehicle to drive straight into the house, and it doesn't. Um, and so you can actually experiment with this as a person. You know, you can just click on the vehicle and try to move it around uh, and see whether you can, because in a simulator, like, you're sort of like God. You can just pick things up and smite them. Um, and so in this case, I'm just moving it further back on its trajectory, and it still tries to plow straight into the house because it's being told to move through the house. Um, and so at some point, you might actually get tired of doing this. Uh, I don't get tired of it. Um, but we keep moving and keep moving, and it's trying and it's trying, and then it gives up again, right? Uh, and so, so then finally, the obvious thing that you have to do, uh, yeah, let me change it here. You know, the obvious thing that you would do if the house was in your way is not steer around the house, but just move the house out of the way. Um, and then the vehicle takes off, right? So we have on board in our composed system a way to intercept commands that we know are unsafe and say, no, thank you, I will not be doing that. So what's next? Where are things going? And what kinds of things can you do? So we're interested in regression testing. I think you, did you want a picture of that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Some of these, I mean, I, I tried to make the font really big so I wouldn't forget that this is like the end of the presentation. Um, so, so we need to have real data that we're getting from real vehicles. This is the metric for success for real systems that we can no longer test on our own archived versions. We need to be testing on real things. And this is something that many of you who are in production systems know, that you need to have a test version, but there are some things you can only test on the live thing, and you don't want to mess it up. Um, and so the difference in our architecture for replacing a module is actually, for, for some enterprise system, is actually not that different from how we can architect it. It's just that the requirements might involve lots of safety conditions. Um, and so in order to make this scale and to make more people to have an impact, you'd like to be able to have great impact for data curation so that you can make your data sets available to other people, that they can run their algorithms on it and see whether they agree with you about the system being safe. Uh, but then finally, one thing that I really want you to think about is how to inspire the next generation and give opportunities to, to people who may not have those opportunities, whether it be through talking to, to the schools or you know, visiting schools and doing things. Maybe it's taking on board uh, a mentor over the summer who has nothing to do or you think they have nothing to do. These kinds of things really will inspire the next generation. They inspired me when I was a young child to, to end up in the career that I'm in. So we have lots of things you can read. I did not do all the work. Most of it came from all of these folks who have done amazing things. Uh, three years of Cat Vehicle. We actually just started the fourth year last week. Um, and of course, none of this would be possible without the support that I have from various funding agencies uh, and generous donors in the United States. So thank you very much. Again, don't forget to do this. Uh, and thank you all. I look forward to talking with you more. Thank you. Um, we got a lot of questions. Unfortunately, I can only choose uh, three, so my apologies. But um, I think Jonathan is, hang is hanging around here all day, so you can ask all the questions. And I would highly recommend uh, to listen to a podcast he made where he answered two hours uh, questions around self-driving cars. So I think it's called Omega Tau Podcast. Just Google it and um, then you get all the answers I cannot ask uh, now. <laughs> okay, um, one question was, what are your thoughts about security against hostile takeover of the car system? Uh, it's not my research area, but this area is definitely important because we want to be able to scale to more vehicles, uh, and the most reliable way to do that is to have the vehicle tell you where it is and what it's doing. Um, but we can't trust that vehicles will always tell us the truth. We need to verify that. Um, and then we also need to have some idea that the systems on board the vehicle haven't been compromised in some way. Uh, and there, there are no easy or fast solutions here. 
um, because the, the adversary might be thinking more steps ahead of you than you are. Uh, and so really the only way to do this, I think, is the same way that we, we handle security for servers, which is lots of patches uh, and, and the ability to check some things to make sure that it's the version that you know that it is. Um, you mentioned the high cost of self-driving cars. Um, even if the cost doesn't go down for all the sensors and stuff, is it still uh, economically uh, feasible if companies like Uber buy a very expensive or buy expensive self-driving cars and um, we just use it on the fly? So even if it's like 5% more expensive, it should be hmm. cheaper than it's now? Yeah, I, I think that that's one model that will probably work. Um, and I think that we'll see taxis that are uh, sort of 2 to 3% uh, within all of the cars that might be in a traffic flow might be taxis that have these kinds of capabilities. Um, we're sort of already doing that with aircraft, that the aircraft is too expensive for any one of us to use, but we share it with one another. Uh, <laughs> and I think that, that's, uh, that, al that also may work for people to be trained inside uh, how to react to different things. So. Okay, last question. Um, oops, I have to find it. Ah, who decides if the car should protect the passengers or bystanders when an imminent crash is detected? Uh, what if the car can detect age or other factors of uh, of the soon to be implicated? That's yeah, so why I, I think I. Yeah. yeah. Do do you crash in uh, rather into an old person or into three? Uh, uh, I, I encourage the, the questioner to attend the philosophy track later today. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so in this case, the, the question is a viable one, and I think um, there's a patent already out there from Google to explain why they will always crash into a minivan instead of to a semi-truck. Uh, and there are reasons to think about why you might do one thing over the other. Um, but, but faced with a decision like this, we're now left to the philosophers and to the authors like Asimov. Uh, more than were left to us. So at some point, somebody will have to make a decision for what that should be. Uh, but that's a that's a terrible kind of choice to make for even a regular driver. Uh, so I I look forward to talking about that in the coffee break. But I have no answers for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much.